is, I think, unique and probably I haven't really presented it in this detail anywhere else. Um, we're going to be a little esoteric. <laughs> Disruptive, inshallah, yeah. And, 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 and the thing is, is that a lot of this is very conceptual, right? So if you're saying, I don't get it, I don't understand it, it's okay. Just mull over it for a while, right? Um, but this is a very new area of information, and there are a lot of interconnecting concepts that go into it. So why did I call this digital asset guidelines and not cryptocurrency guidelines? Because in general, the area of digital assets is much broader than just cryptocurrency coins and tokens. We have NFTs, we have LP tokens, we have a lot of different, we have smart contracts, a lot of things that are all floating in the same universe. So let's talk about definitions. A few definitions that we're going to go over. If you want to snap photos of this, you know, feel free to. Um, consensus mechanisms, generally, uh, a protocol that determines how transactions are validated and added to a blockchain. This comes up in issues of staking a lot. A digital asset is anything that exists in a digital format and comes with the right to use. Digital means it doesn't have a physical counterpart. Um, there's a small mistake here. Tender should be on another line. Tender is something that's offered for its value. Exogenous is a fancy word that means its value is a function of an external authority. Endogenous means its value is a function of demand. Those two are very important terms when it comes to determining what is considered a currency or not. Something is fungible when it's able to be replaced by another identical item. So this bottle of water is fungible with that bottle of water if they are of the same quantity and the same amount. Non-fungible means it's not able to be replaced by another identical item. Like an original Van Gogh painting. It's unique. There's only one of them. It's not fungible. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. An ICO, when a DAO company, development team, development team, looks to raise money to create a new coin, app, service, an ICO is a way, an initial coin offering is a way that they raise funds. LP token is a liquidity pair token. It's representative of a pair of values that are submitted to a decentralized exchange in exchange for providing liquidity. Medium of exchange. Medium of exchange is an intermediary instrument used to facilitate sale, purchase, or trade of goods between parties. MLM, multi-level marketing. It's a practice of selling goods or services on behalf of a company in a system whereby participants receive commission on their sales as well as the sales of any participants they recruit. They recruit. Money supply, it's the total amount of money in circulation for any given currency. A Ponzi scheme, a Ponzi scheme is a form of fraud in which belief in the success of a non-existent enterprise, a non-existent business, is fostered by the payment of quick returns to the first investors from money invested by later investors. So I invest now, I'm getting paid by anybody that comes in after me. So yes, there is a a uh, direct correlation between multi-level marketing schemes and Ponzi schemes. A reward structure. Any stimulus with the pen potential to incentivize users to approach and consume a given good or service. Store of value is an asset that acts as a measure of benefit that can be saved, retrieved, and exchanged in the future. Lots of definitions that you'll probably have to come back to, but I think it's important to define terms up front. Now I want to take you through the kind of logical, the way that I see a rational breakdown of how we get to different types of digital assets. Here we're gonna use the word digital tender, right? And we said tender is anything that's issued for value to refer to digital content 
offered for its value. Digital content can be fungible or it can be non-fungible. Fungible meaning that there are many of the same type. A very common form of fungible digital con content is a copy of Microsoft Word. You can download the, the, uh, the EXE file, the MSI file, and it's going to be the exact same every time that you download it. You put it from one computer, put it to another computer, it gets corrupted, you download the same, it's the same. Non-fungible would be a digital contract between you and another person. There's only one of them, and it's irreplaceable. If a digital tender is non-fungible, but it holds value set by a market, then it is a digital asset. NFTs are an example of this. What does an NFT stand for? It stands for non-fungible token. It is a representation of an underlying asset that there is one of that is one of a kind and that you have the right to you have the right to own and profit from. If a digital tender is fungible and it has a value set by developers, not a market, meaning it's not accepted as a medium of exchange yet, then it's either going to be an LP token, liquidity pair token, ICO token, initial coin offering token, or similar. So this is, if somebody creates art or transfers something that they own into a digital, a digital form of which there is only one form, but people buy and sell it, then it's a digital asset and NFTs are like this. What does, what determines whether or not it's allowed to buy or invest in an NFT? What the underlying thing contained by the NFT is. So I tell people, for example, you can have, you can go to Wikimedia and download a picture of Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. Does that mean that you own Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh? No. It means that you have a digital representation of that painting now on your computer. You have somebody has a bored ape and you screenshot their bored ape. Do you own their bored ape? No. You simply have a screenshot of it. Now, now imagine if not only did you have a screenshot of it, but let's say, for example, you went outside and you took a picture of the art festival that's happening down the street. And then you went to Getty Images and you sold that to Getty Images. Now they own that photo that you took. It's only a digital photo. It was on your DS DLSR camera. And then now you've sold it to someone else. So that's a digital creation that you sold to someone else. It's a digital asset. Now every time Getty Images lets someone else use that asset, they do what? They take royalties. You can either pay them per usage or you can simply pay them a fee and rent the use of all of their photos at one time. Imagine instead of having to sell your photo to an aggregator like Getty Images, instead you could just keep your, your image on a blockchain and every time someone uses it, they pay you the royalty instead of, instead of some corporation. That's the idea behind the NFT. It secures your rights to the use of a digital asset. It's not the asset itself, right? So yeah, I can take a screenshot of, uh, of, uh, of an NFT, right? The, art, the artwork contained by an NFT, but that doesn't give me the right to profit off of it, uh, nor will I ever receive that. But in a smart contract, which is underlies the NFT, then anytime that's used, I'm automatically going to get paid for its usage. Excuse me. Now let's say, for example, this is point number two here. A group of developers get together and they say, you know what? We've got a great idea for using blockchain technology 
and cryptocurrencies for facilitating trade finance or facilitating logistics. And therefore, we're going to create a coin that we're going to offer to the public. And when they buy it, then that coin will have value. And the more that it's used, the more that that value will grow. Initially, though, in order to be able to offer it to people, they're going to have to set the value themselves, and they're going to have to wait to see if people will adopt it. That's number two here on the digital tender that's fungible, the value set by the developers, and it doesn't have a market for it yet. That's your initial coin offering, that's your LP token, or similar. You're simply offering a digital asset. Initial coin offering is you're saying, we want this coin to be used for a certain purpose. Like, for example, VeChain for uh, uh, logistics, um, used in the logistics world. An LP token would be something like Uniswap token, right? Where you're putting in a liquidity pair, you're giving both Ethereum and Bitcoin, essentially funding their ability to exchange tokens for other people, charge them for that exchange, and then you make a percentage of the money. So you're essentially going into a partnership with a bunch of other people to provide a service of exchange. If, however, that digital tender is fungible, right? So now we've gone past the, the idea of it just being uh, uh, unique. It has a value set by the market. So that coin that you created for logistics or trade finance or whatever else is now beyond just you offering it. Other people are buying it and selling it, and it's become a medium of exchange. It is now considered a coin or a cryptocurrency. In terms of... Uh, in terms of currencies in general and, and kind of the con concept, concepts behind currencies, it would be the difference between a weak currency and a strong currency. Or a, 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 a currency in circulation or a currency that's not yet in circulation. So what makes up a valid cryptocurrency? Now that we know that there's a difference between NFTs, ICOs and LP tokens, and then cryptocurrency. What makes up a valid, a permissible cryptocurrency? In order for a cryptocurrency to be valid, it must, number one, have a permissible use case. I could tell you about impermissible use cases, but unfortunately, I can't repeat many of those things in the masjid. When you see impermissible uh, coin offerings, you will know them because they're usually involved in something extremely seedy and, uh, and lewd. Right? Or they're clearly backing up something which is impermissible. Number two, it should have a secure money supply. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And number three, there should be no intrinsic susceptibility to fraud. So it has to have a permissible use case. We can just go right back to what we talked about when we talked about what makes a permissible stock. And that is, it should avoid supporting alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, gambling or betting operations, cinema, adult entertainment, and the like, conventional financial services. So there are some coins out there that are simply leveraged products, right? They're simply recreating the, 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 the cesspool of, of, of predatory interest-based finance in the DeFi world, unfortunately. So I don't like to write off everything in DeFi because I think there's a lot of good that can be done. But what we're finding right now is a lot of people are saying, hey, this is our opportunity Then instead of waiting for the banks to rip everybody off, we get to do it first. Right? Which is why I'm very cautious on telling people, no, don't think that everything in the DeFi space or the cryptocurrency space is impermissible, but also don't just throw your money into anything. Understand what you're getting into. So it has to have a permissible use case. It shouldn't be involved in any of these things that are listed here on that, on this page, right? Number two, and this is a very important one because this is, everybody says, well, you know, it's a, it's a medium of exchange, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a store of value, and so, uh, you know, it must be permissible. And what they don't realize is that your cryptocurrency is 
representative of code. And that code contains instructions or allowances for that coin to be manipulated or not. So generally when you offer a coin, you're going to, have, you're going to bifurcate that, you're going to split it up into two different things. You're going to have something called the distribution, and then you're going to have the general supply. Distribution is the amount of token supply that you give to developers to incentivize them to develop, to early investors who funded the development of that, or to other insiders who might have been advisors or early marketers. The offering is what's going to go to the general public. So you might create a cryptocurrency, and let's say, for example, you know, it has an outstanding supply of you know, 4 million coins, and you're going to take the first quarter of a million, 250,000 coins, and distribute it amongst the people that developed it. Now it's going to go to market, and once people buy it and it starts to have uh, uh, value, then the value of the coins that they have is going to go up. Why is having a secure money supply so important? Because what we want to avoid is we want to avoid the ability of the developers or the marketers or anyone that's involved at an early stage from rug pulling, rug pulling or affecting the value of the currency. So if your currency is code and your code contains a back door that says at any given time the developers can transfer all of the money all of the value to their own wallets and then sell it, you essentially will be left with nothing. How many of you here have heard of Squidcoin? I'm not going to ask who got taken on Squidcoin, but if you've heard of Squidcoin, that's enough. It was like the real life Squid Games. It was a very sadistic uh, uh, you know, enterprise of you know, people putting money into something and then I can't remember how much was actually taken, but it was, a, it, was a, it was quite a large amount. So you don't want to have backdoors and ability of developers to essentially rug pull and steal all of the value from the coin supply. How is that protected against? Well, it's protected against by transparency from the developers, locking their code it being certified by an external source for compliance. And there are a couple of different or organizations or agencies that offer third-party ex you know, external validation of coin offerings to make sure that they don't ha have you know, distributions that are questionable or susceptible to fraud. So for the distribution in general, we want to make sure that the distribution to insiders, developers, marketers, investors, is not greater than 30% of the total supply. Why are we limited at 30%? We just talked about the 30% issue with stocks. Why are we talking about limiting it to 30%? Because we want to, we want to prevent excessive allocation of the value contributed by the public and the investors to insiders on an ad hoc basis. When it gets over 30%, we're essentially saying, give us all of your money, right, for us giving you the ability to just be with us. And by, by giving more than 30%, this, was, this would constitute misappropriation, or what we say in Arabic, devouring people's wealth falsely, as the Quran terms it. So we want to avoid people being taken advantage of. So again, for those of you who that weren't here earlier, we said that the 30% rule is an objective standard set by the Prophet ﷺ for determining what is excessive and what is not. So if we see a coin offering where more than 30% is going to people that uh, will directly benefit simply from the offering, right, uh, and will, will take value from the public and take it to themselves, then that should be avoided, and I would say that it would be impermissible to invest in that coin offering. I'm sorry? You, so, so that's a very good question. Is the distribution documented? 
It should be. And if it's not, then you should avoid it. If you ever come across the coin offering, because like what a lot of people do to, to make money on the blockchain is they'll go to, for example, coin offerings that are on test, the test net, right? So let's say, for example, it's on the Ethereum network or Solana or something like that. You have the test net and then you have the, 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 the main net. The test net is when people are early investors, they're coming in, Usually, the, the, the price of the coin is extremely cheap, but it's also extremely volatile and extremely risky. So people go in and they buy that, and then as soon as it goes live to the main net, then they sell, right? Just like people do with an IPO in the stock world, right? You don't want to get into that unless the distribution is actually uh, announced, and, and you can see it through the technical documents, the white papers, and there's some transparency around that. Otherwise, it's very likely that the developers have some kind of backdoor in the code that will allow them to rug pull at a later time. Another thing that we want to avoid is we want to make sure that there is no inherent susceptibility to fraud. So what does that mean? That means that it does not incorporate fees or rewards that kick back coins purchased to previous holders. Oh, well, if you own this coin, then every time somebody buys into this coin, we're going to give you 10% of what they bought. That is the definition of a Ponzi scheme. And if you have trouble understanding what a Ponzi scheme is and how insidious it is, then, and somebody can look up the name of it. So there's a movie with Robert De Niro where he played, um, what's his name? He played um, Bernie Madoff. Everybody heard of Bernie Madoff? The, so Bernie Madoff, one of the most famous Ponzi schemes of the modern period. So Robert De Niro, it's this HBO produced film uh, about the life of Bernie Madoff and how he ripped off his investors. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. As far as like financial cinema, stuff for a lot, Sheikh's telling us to watch a movie. It's, there's nothing bad in it, there's something haram in it, okay? But I highly recommend that movie to understand the, the evil of a Ponzi scheme, okay? So if you're investing in something and the only way that you're, 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 you're deriving value from that is not through a consensus mechanism where you have to do work like Bitcoin or you have to validate and provide computing power like Ethereum, but the only way you're getting extra coins from that coin is by holding the coin and waiting for more people to buy the coin, then that's the definition of a Ponzi scheme. So this could be fee just redistribution at the time of purchase, it can be staking rewards that are not algorithmic, that they're not based on algorithmic verification of the blockchain, or structures that contain kickbacks, Ponzi-like schemes, or multi-level multi marketing rewards just for holding the coin. And they can show up in different ways, and a lot of times they'll simply call it our reward structure or our staking structure, and in reality, it's nothing. It's nothing more than them paying themselves and you from the money of new investors. Why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Let me tell you a story. Long time ago, when calling cards were really, really popular here in the United States, who remembers that? Everybody was selling, like, you know, calling cards. You know, you, you buy a card, you get some inter international minutes to be able to, set, to, to sell. So we had this friend who, mashallah, had always done well for himself in business. And a bunch of the guys came to him and he said, hey, there's this calling card thing now where if like you sign up, um, you're going to get rewards for us signing up through you and then we're going to sign up a bunch of people and they're going to get a, lunch, a bunch of rewards as well. So he looked at everybody. I remember we, it was like after Asr at his home. He looked at everybody, he smiled. And he said, guys, I'm going to take all of your money. But if you want me to do it, I'll do it. But I'm telling you right now, this is a ripoff. No, 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 it's not a ripoff. We swear. You, got, you guys came to me because you feel that I know business better than you. I'm telling you right now that somebody's going to get caught up at the end and they're not going to have a good time. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It, it's, it's got value. It's, a, it's, it's call minutes. He goes, okay. He puts 10,000 down on the deal, right? I think over time, he like tripled that amount. 
And then at the end, you know, obviously he's at the, ha- at the head of the pyramid. And then the next level, they were happy, they made some money. And then the next level made some money. And then the next level made a little, little bit of money. And then the next level, everything became so diluted that they couldn't get more people to buy the cards. So what happens when you can't get more people to buy your calling cards? Everything falls down. Nobody makes more money going up the, the, the pyramid and everybody gives up. And the whole pyramid comes crashing down. The whole house of cards comes crashing down. And that's what's happening with many of cryptocurrencies that have these types of kickback structures for rewards. So you should be very acutely aware that unless they're using like a proof of work or a proof of stake reward structure, then you have to look into it carefully and make sure that they're not simply doing a Ponzi-like kickback, which simply means that it is susceptible to fraud. What's a a qualitative measure of gauging fraud? How can we actually tell what would lend itself to fraud or not? Number one is the transparency of the development team's identities. There is a lot of anonymity in crypto, the cryptocurrency world. Everybody is Satoshi and Shibtoshi and Badoshi and Mario Toshi and everybody wants to be the next Satoshi Yakamoto, right? Making up names, you know, they're the Doge father and, you know, whatever else. If they don't have verifiable identities, then there is a very, very uh, uh, large chance that there could be a rug pull. There's a very large chance that you could lose your money. Why? Because there would be no recourse. You would not be able to find who they are or take anything from them. Find out, you know, who they are. And even sometimes when they're known, there can still, that can still happen. There was a case in South Africa where two guys made off with millions of dollars after claim, you know, for Bitcoin uh, investments. But that points to the second problem, and that is, what is the documentation associated with the project that you're investing in? Is it simply, uh, you know, found on an exchange, right? Are you simply able to, you know, to purchase it from uh, Uniswap or some other exchange, um, or you know, do you, you know, do, do, do is there actual? documentation associated with the coin that tells you the technology used, how it was developed, what it does, and then allows you access to the code. Because the, the whole point behind the cryptocurrency movement was to put all of the information on the blockchain and for there to be blockchain analysis and for people to know that this money uh, transferred from this address to that address and this is how that happened. So if there's not sufficient documentation on how it works, you should be wary. And then lastly, the use of marketing to pump the coin independent of its actual function and use case. So why do we want this coin? It's a meme coin that inspires financial independence in the youth of the internet sphere, whatever, right? I can't, I can't even bring myself to, to like properly mock some of the, the, the ridiculous taglines that you find in some of these projects, right? Because there's no substance whatsoever. Now, if they said, well, this is going to be a, you know, for example, a, um, a, a, a coin that's going to be used for uh, banana farmers in Ecuador, in Ecuador and giving them uh, the ability to navigate many international currencies through one coin and uh, doing transfers and payments for that, the trade of, of bananas from Ecuador, right? Banana coins, actually, it was, there was an actual banana coin. I don't know if it's still trading. Okay, now we know that there is an actual use case. It's not just some guy on Reddit or 4chan or 8chan, maybe 16chan, I don't know, that is just telling you, you know, buy, 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 to the moon, to the moon, to the moon. It's gonna, you know, rocket ship emoji, rocket ship emoji. Exactly, stick to the fundamentals, you don't have to worry about them. 
Absolutely. But it, it has to be said, right? We have to say this because everybody, the problem is, is that it's like we talked about yesterday, right? Talib uh, al-dunya uh, kisharib al-khamr. Kullu ma shariba atash. The, the, the seeker of, of this lowly life is like the, the, the consumer of alcohol. Every time he drinks, he gets more thirsty. So you make a little bit of money off of a coin, and that's it. You can't give it up. You want to do it, you want to do it again, you want to do it again. You take risks that you normally would not take. Why? Because of visions of sugar plum dancing in your head that you're going to make, you know, a million dollars in a couple of moments. And unfortunately, a lot of times, those exponential returns. Now, a lot of people have made very good money legitimately in cryptocurrencies, right? But a lot of people have done a lot of fraud as well. So we can therefore conclude that in order for a digital tender to be considered a cryptocurrency, it must be fungible, endogenous, and a token. It has to be used as a store of value and a medium of exchange. This is the most important slide up here. It has to be a store of value and a medium of exchange with a permissible use case and a secure money supply as well as no susceptibility to fraud directly through its tokenomics or indirectly through its marketing. This is, sums up everything that we said today. The first point has to do with the issuance. The second point has to do with the functionality and the use. And if you can implement all of that, then go ahead and invest. Some of you are going to say, some of the information is not, in, is, is not available to me at all times. And I'm making a best effort to understand it. Make a best effort. One thing that I don't want to do and what I don't like is to sit up here and give you the impression that everything is haram unless I say so. That's not what I'm saying. What I want is I want you to walk away and say, Joe gave us the rules. Now it's on me to implement these rules. And you'll make your best effort and you will invest in certain things and then it will become clear to you later that you did it. For example, I used to, inv I used, I bought Shiba Inu coin when it was issued early on. Because I thought that they were going to be going the route of like an LP token and there, you know, there would be some benefit from that. The more I learned, the more documentation became clear, the more it became clear that even through their documentation and white papers, there was some fishy backdoor stuff going on. I released that video that I made and I sold everything that I helped. Now, some of you are going to ask, if I, invested in, if I invested into a coin and then I found out later that the money that I made was impermissible because the coin turned out to be impermissible, what do I do? Number one, if the use case of that coin was impermissible from the outset, all of your gains is impermissible. Most of the ones that I know that are, have impermissible use cases, again, I can't repeat the names of them in the masjid. But let's say, for example, there is, there is, a, there is a coin, I forget the name of it, that is specific to funding wineries and, and vintages of wine. And you and and you and that um, information was available to you when you bought that. All of your gains from that coin are impermissible. Falakum usu amwadikum. Take out your initial investment, and everything else has to be given away. However, if you invested in something like shib, in, in shib, right, or some other coin that you found out later on had this Ponzi-esque uh, kickback style reward structure, and you made some money, if you made money off of the growth of the coin in the market and its trade, then that money is, is, is yours. But if you made money off of the staking, aka Ponzi scheme reward, then you give away that portion of the gains and the rest of it is yours to keep. Okay. So lastly, how to differentiate between uh, content tokens and coins? You can ask a couple of questions. Number one, was the tender, what do we say a tender is? Something that's offered for value. Does it have a permissible use case? If no, it's not permissible. If yes, 
and go to question two. Number two, does the tender function as a store of value? If yes, then it's a token. If no, then it's just digital content, like artwork in an NFT. Number three, if, if, is the token fungible or non-fungible? If it's non-fungible, then it's a digital asset, like a smart contract or an NFT or something. If it's fungible, go to question four. Question four, is the value of the fungible token determined, determined exogenously, meaning a function of the authority that issues it, or endogenously, en endogenously a function of its demand in the market? If it's the former, then it's a token that functions as a digital asset, like an LP token or an ICO. And if it's the latter, fortunately that got cut off by the screen. If it's the latter, then it functions like a cryptocurrency. And we go back to the previous slide where we talked about permissible use case, so on and so forth. All right? So I hope that you all are thoroughly confused, so much that you won't ask questions, and I can drink my tea. Otherwise, if you have gotten it all, feel, feel free to ask uh, any questions that you have. Yes. Right. It's a mathematical impossibility. Yes. Yeah, four quintillion issuance. No, you, you make a, you make a very good point, and that is that many of these coins they have you know they, they have such a large supply that in order for them to get to any significant value. Um, unless you have a significant portion of that value already in your own wallet, right? So if I'm a developer and I own 50% of the value of that, you know, four quintillion, and then I go and I tell everybody to buy into it for, you know, two cents each, with the claim that it's going to go to a dollar, there's too many of them to actually go to a dollar. That amount of liquidity is not going to come in that fast. But I can make a lot of money off of taking one fourth of one penny from a couple hundred thousand people, right? I think that's the point that you're making. So it's ripe for fraud, but not for actual growth and investment. And that's a very important point to look at is, you know, how much are actual, is actually being offered and how do you get your hands on it? Because if it's through proof of work, then you actually have to do something to get it like Bitcoin, right? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Those are very good questions, and I'm glad that you asked them. So yes, while we don't know who the one person or group of people that created Bitcoin is, we do have access to, uh, the, the, to the code and to all of the documentation that shows that it is not susceptible to fraud, right? And that there is actual work that has to be done to, actual, to actually mine uh, the coins algorithmically and extract that value. So. Knowing the developer is not necessarily a must, right? If you, have, if you have a closed system with set rules, which is what Bitcoin is. But in proof of stake systems and other consensus me mechanisms, there's about eight, eight or nine different consensus mechanisms, then it becomes much more susceptible to fraud because they're constantly being developed. They're not set code that basically has to be mined. And that's the difference between Bitcoin and others. And that's why many people will say, you know, they really only, uh, only view Bitcoin as the only true viable cryptocurrency. 
um, because of, uh, it, it, it avoids all of these things that we talked about. Now, whether or not uh, cryptocurrency is more Islamic than fiat currency, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be Islamic? And if that means that we have the potential to avoid fraud and, uh, and the uh, usurpation and misappropriation of people's purchasing power, then the potential in cryptocurrency is greater than the potential in fiat currency. Um, no, no, I'm saying the opposite. Yeah, I'm saying that the, the, the ability to hard code, the inability to make it extremely deflationary, extremely inflationary, is easier in crypto than it is in fiat. And the problem with, the many, with many fiat systems and monetary policies, and my friend Jerry is going to crucify me for this, as a good friend of mine that we discuss these things about, as a brother who's an, econom who an economist that we talk about these things all the time. Uh, so when he sees the video, he's going to... You know, you know, it's going to be like a slasher film or something like that. Um, but uh, yes, fiat currencies have the power of law behind them, and they have the pow 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 power of monetary policy. But time and time again, we see those that monetary policy uh, siding with uh, the, the 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 stronger uh, the the stronger in society rather than the weak, extracting value from. Uh, from, from the poor. You know, inflation is a tax uh, that's a hidden tax on your money. Um, and so uh, I, I can't say in terms of definitively, but as far as potential, then yes, I think that there's a lot of potential for, uh, you know, to basically have the rules of fairness hard-coded into what you consider to be a medium of exchange. Now, whether it's deflationary or inflationary is something else because having that elasticity in the money supply sometimes is of value, right? Um, but that's a, that's a larger discussion. But I think the potential is, is there. Moment. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where the whole exogenous, endogenous uh, uh, thing comes in, where it, it have a group of people agreed that this is going to have value and be exchanged amongst them in fungible, quantifiable amounts, or not? Or is it being set by an external authority, right? So um, in, the, in, in the fiat world, you have it, it's, it's exogenous. It's being set by monetary policy and money supplies being set by someone else. And that can happen in crypto as well. Um, but if we have uh, the known rules and they're set and it's being set by the market and we've all agreed to use this between ourselves, then uh, it's, it's considered a currency Islamically. And the only stipulation for trading a currency is two. Number one is that you cannot trade the same currency for its own, uh, its own uh, 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 denomination, or not denomination, but its own issue. So you can't do gold for gold, silver for silver, or Bitcoin for Bitcoin. Which, yes, that means that levered pro leveraged products and wrap-ups and Bitcoin staggering and, 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 you know, and, and all of these leveraged products in the crypto world are not allowed. Forwards and futures and all that not allowed. So you have to, you have to trade uh, uh, differing counter values, right? Different counter currencies, and it has to be a spot transaction. And if you can do both of those, and it's used as a unit of exchange, store of value, or medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of measure, then it's a currency. Now, whether it's a weak currency because it's used in a small uh, uh, sphere of influence and use users, or a strong currency in that it's used in broader than that, that's where, that's where the, the, the differing values come in and the, and, and the price fluctuation comes in. 
as people start to gain it. And, and this is not foreign to humanity, first and foremost, or to Islamic societies. Meaning that in Muslim societies, we've always had competing governments that each one came and they issued their own coin. And every time they issued a coin, they tried to recall the coins that were there before. And people said, no, we're not going to recall these coins. We're going to keep using the coins because we trust these coins more than your coins. Right? And so you had number, a number of different currencies that were all being used simultaneously and being exchanged according to their market values. Yeah. Yes? Sure. That's okay. So the question is about decentralization um, and how this relates to, say, issues of Islamic political economy, um, you know, money supply and all of that. Uh, in the time of the Prophet, والسلام, the coinage that was used or the value that was exchanged for was generally precious metals, uh, gold and silver. Um, later on in the early Islamic period, copper coins called flus uh, arose, which was a, represented, a, represent, a representative currency. Not a fiat currency, but a representative currency. And then you had different issue, you know, issuing bodies in different regions, right? Um, in the very early Islamic period, you would have, for example, a gold coin by the Sassanid uh, Empire with, you know, one of the, with Khosrow or Archimedes or somebody on the back. And then, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, yani, Imarat Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, struck on the other side. Because they knew that that coin, the, the original issuance of it was important to people for them to know the provenance of that gold. And then for it to be accepted in Muslim lands was another thing. So competing currencies and competing issuances have never really been an issue. One of the, the, the decentralization, I think, uh, uh, devoids the, the currency space of widespread manipulation. I mean, why would you, you know, like for example, in, in, in many Muslim majority countries, and you can see this, and almost every time you read somebody, they say, well, there's a fatwa that Bitcoin is haram. Or there's a fatwa that, that, that uh, I said fat coin. That's the new crypto coin. We, Omar and I are going to issue that. Um, every time they, you know, they say, well, cryptocurrencies are, are haram, right? And you look, it's really issues of political economy. It's not the functionality of the coin or the value that it said. They say, well, the, the legitimate ruler is the only one with the, with the uh, ability to issue coins or to issue currency. Where did that come from? They usually cite Ibn Muflih uh, al hanbali in his book Al-Furur that mentions that Imam Ahmed says that he dislikes for uh, everyone to be able to issue a currency as it would lead itself to tala'ub and ghish of just deceit and, 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 and people you know, playing games. And that's not the exact quote, but something like that. Thing is, is that three lines down in that same very paragraph, he says, but if there are multiple currencies being used in one space that, e that people have considered to have value amongst them, then it is valid for their buying and their selling and their paying their zakat and so on and so forth. Right? So the, the, the early political economy of Islam was never as strict as people are making it now. What we have is a usurpation of one, of, of, of one statement to bolster political authority of people that don't want to free people from their very closed authoritarian fiat currency environments where the, the value of their currency is being consistently sapped and uh, people are essentially working as serfs for the government. And, and 
Some people might not like it, but oh well. I mean, that's the reality of it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's a simple thing. So the sister here in the back, and then... Yes. Salaam alaikum. I'm sorry, when it comes to what? Mm-hmm. So the sister asked a question about the, um, the, the power usage for mining of Bitcoin and its transfer. And that's been one of the constant, uh, probably the, 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 the strong, the, it's had the strongest effect on deterring people from, from kind of getting into Bitcoin or even in mining it um, because of the claims of power, uh, of power usage. Uh, I don't recall the exact study, but I believe that many of those claims were debunked recently. Um, there, were, there was an early study uh, about the, the, the energy usage, uh, and that was debunked. You guys remember? Yes? Yes, 60% of the miners on, are on renewable energy, right? Or? Or more. Yeah, so... I'm very, very, I'm very, very skeptical of mainstream news media, uh, and, and I'm not like a conspiracy. Oh, the main, you know, the lamestream media. I don't want to go into like that type of thing, but there, especially financial media, is very manipulative. And if you notice, in the past six months, we've been told that Bitcoin in general, or Bitcoin in specific, and cryptocurrency in general, is bad for the environment. We've been told that um, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin users are mainly uh, uh, angry white supremacists. Uh, we've been told that they're fascists. We've been told, and simultaneously, okay, that's in the general, you know, gen pop finan financial media. But if you are, if you're watching specialized financial media, right, then you also see that Jamie Dimon is changing his position towards Bitcoin. Many people that were looked at Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as farcical or, 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 or you know, non-starter are now saying, yeah, we're going to start a fund. So to, to, what that says to me is it's positioning. It's make the general population stay away from it. We position it because there is going to be a shift. Whether it's to Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else, there's going to be a shift digitally. And when that happens, whoever's positioned now will be in a much better place at that time. So I, I, I just always take those things with a, a grain of salt. Yes. Yes, brother, where did you get that information? He's going to look it up now and find it. Okay, the sister back here, and then Ahmed. So um, the sister asked a question about purchasing Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies through like PayPal or Cash App and money applications, right? Um, or, or, you know, do you have to get Coinbase? All of them function on the same principle, okay? All of them are exchanges or brokers that are giving you access to cryptocurrencies. The important thing that you have to ask yourself when you're buying a cryptocurrency through an exchange is are they going to give you the keys to that, that coin? Be PayPal doesn't? Okay, so PayPal doesn't. But stri the Strike app does, and there's no fees. Right? There's an app called Strike. This Cash app? Cash app allows you to get the keys. So as long as you can get the keys, then you can transfer it to a cold wallet, you know, you can transfer it to a, 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 you know, a digital wallet, whatever you want to do, right? And that's what's really important, so that you're not locked in to a closed system in, in using whatever, whatever crypto you want to. How does that relate to? I, 
I mean, essentially, you know, as far as Islamically, they would divide up the ownership per whatever proportions they're given. What logistically, however, how would you facilitate for the, that for them? Then there's a, a new thing in the estate planning world called the digital access plan or a digital access agreement, which basically allows your heirs the ability to contact technology companies uh, on your behalf as, as, as either your administrator after your death or, or your heir at law and shut down your social media accounts, withdraw value from accounts and things like that. So getting something in, in, in place like that is really important. Yeah. Uh, Right. Sure. Right. So, so, so you make you make several good points, and I don't want to, I don't want to generalize across all scholars and all fatawi. Uh, for example, Sheikh Ali Al Qarhdagi, in his fatwa about cryptocurrency, uh, he he makes that argument, right, that you made. It's not necessarily now he does, I believe, mention the political authority issue. He does also mention mention the issue of recourse, right, and that's and that's and that is a is a valid concern, right. Um, but that also is very system dependent upon which of the cryptocurrencies that you're using, right? Um, cryptocurrency, you know, fiat currency has value um, because the backing of the government. The government has value because they are representative of the people. Um, if you get the government out of the way, then the, the, crypt, the, the currency can have value because of the representation of the people without an intermediary in between. Um, so I don't see that that is necessarily the, the issue for volatility. Also, in any initial offering for any type of asset, whether it is a currency, uh, a stock, uh, wh whatever it may be, there's always initial volatility in its formative years. And as it grows and as it's, it's accepted more, it, it, it pans out. Uh, and, and you can see that same type of volatility play out in the gold markets, the silver markets, palladium markets. Um, added to that that you still have the same level of manipulation that happens in those precious metal markets 
um, and even in the dollar. The difference is, is that when the government controls the money supply, uh, there is uh, maybe not the, the, the massive volatility because they can, because they can inject or, or remove from the supply, but there is the, de the degradation of the purchasing power over time, which is really what's important and not necessarily the, the, the volatility per se. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily see, uh, I see the recourse as, as important, right? Either through the governance of the coin itself or through the government's uh, uh, regulation of that. Um, anything that falls in between those two where the coin doesn't have proper governance and there's no government regulation should be avoided. Um, because that, that will cause you to essentially lose a lot. Yeah. Yes, Mayid. So it's a good. So you have, the question is about NFT minting, right? Um, if the NFT mint has enough distinguishing information uh, at the time of offering, although you don't know the exact NFT that you will re you, you, you will receive, right? But you do know the type, you do know the artist, you do know the the general description of it. But you don't know if it's going to have, uh, you know you know, feature A, feature B, or feature C, but it will have features one, two, and three, right? And as long as there's enough discerning information for you to know what you're getting will be of some value, then in my opinion, it would be permissive. Allah knows best. But the quality, the quality that may, that, that may differ based upon very individual characteristics um, would be contingent on uh, what people see in that after its issue. And do you know the rarity level before you buy, you buy the issue? Yeah, so in, in, that, in that case, everybody's purchasing the same thing, but there is some chance that, there, that, that something might be, uh, might be uh, subjectively considered more rare than others, right? Um, or more val the subjective value would be different based upon that rarity. I don't see that as... As, uh, and I may be wrong, but I don't see that as sufficient enough in, in, in saying that, that the function of the issue would be impermissible. But I do, I do caution everybody from putting way too much money in overpriced JPEGs and things that are really nothing more than a Veblen good. A Veblen good is something which has no value outside of simply owning it, right? It's a status symbol. And uh, we were talking about this last night. Like, a Ferrari is a status symbol, right? But you can also drive it, right? But an NFT is a status symbol that you just display, right? Um, so I, as far as like the whole, you know, cartoon uh, NFTs thing, I, I really just don't see it. Number one is the whole issue of drawing and, and, you know, images and things like that. And then number two is beyond simply owning it, you know, beyond owning, one of 10,000 computer generated images, what is there other than status? And that to me points to uh, something of, 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 of value of, you know, what is the actual value that, that's being imparted? As, you know, ma'lumiyat al muthman with thaman, you know, knowing the price as well as knowing the underlying value of what you're buying is important. Um, and, it, and, it's in, and it's imperative for the permissibility of, of a, um, of something that you're that you're purchasing, so you know there there are uses of NFTs um, for photography, right? Um, where unique you know unique actual unique art, whether it's digital or physical, um, whether that you know NFT and digital art is is 
uh, fi fixed back to a, f a physical product or not. You know, that's there. Uh, NFTs have started to be used for uh, real estate transactions. Um, so the, the technology is one thing, and then the application is another. So this is the application becomes a judgment call, and, and you understanding the actual value of what you're getting when you buy it. Otherwise, it can, it can very much border on gambling when there's actually no value other than the status. Yeah. Yes. Okay, say that again, Harvard Business Review. Coin shares. Coinbase. Square. And a website called Brains with an S or a Z? With an, okay. And two I's. Brains. Okay. ESG is reviewing energy consumption by Bitcoin, um, whatever, uh, whatever else you said. Okay. Yeah. You can issue a derivative. Canuck coin and corner the Canadian Bitcoin mining market. Um, what are we looking at on time as far as Oscar coming in? And what time is it now? Yes, yeah, Salam. I'm kind of reaching my, my limit for talking, though. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Some of them are, some of them are. Like, we, we do have to be fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Hmm. Yeah. You're saying they're not doing the job of governance. I mean, I, I, t I tend to agree with you. I think the only scare, the only fear that I have with the cryptocurrency space is that I see a lot of the same uh, uh, interest-bearing, um, uh, exploitative practices being recreated in the DeFi space. Not with the issuance of individual coins, but the same kind of lending and leverage and, and, and these types of, of, of practices that you know, the, the fraud is, is, is mostly what we've talked about today, right? I mean, there's a whole other thing about the, the, the exchange and the lending and the borrowing and the elastic interest rates and all of these things that have kind of cropped up around just the simple issuance of a coin that worries me great. And so I don't, I don't necessarily want to say replace an elected government as corrupt as it may be in, or as inept, as inept as it may be in monetary policy for uh, like a, 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 a phantom group of people that are doing the same thing through crypto. So I, sure. I, I agree there, I agree. We, we don't have any qualms there, right? 
Um, but I, I'm, I'm talking about the space in general. Space in general. Any other questions? Yes, Yoga. Yes. Yeah, so if there's a royalty in an F NFT, it's generally hard-coded. So let's say, for example, you create a unique piece of art and you wrap it in an NFT. And anyone who owns that NFT is going to pay you a royalty for uh, holding it and for using it from the, you know, there on, like a royalty, right? Um, so because you still have creative rights that are embodied in that. And holding a royalty in something that you've created is not... Uh, it's not foreign to, I mean, what usually goes on in publishing, right? Um, uh, with real estate, uh, it's more about, you know, uh, creating an LLC, the LLC being registered to the NFT, and then whoever holds the NFT, then they're the owner of the LLC, which is the owner of the, of the real estate. Now, obviously, that's a couple of levels that's there, but if you, I think it was like maybe less than six months ago, um, there was a, in all places, a, a, an NFT sale of, uh, of uh, real estate in Ukraine. And Vitalik Buterin ha actually um, went in, in and attended the, 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 the sale of it as a way of saying, yeah, this is a great way that people are using EC, you know, EC20 contracts um, for NFTs and, 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 all, and all of that. And there are a few, um, there are a few, uh, uh, companies, and I'm drawing a blank on the names, that have, are actually kind of creating the process for doing this more for hard assets. So the NFT will simply be representative of the right to that hard asset. Uh, so there's a lot, there's, to me, there's a lot that can be done in that space um, that gets out of it merely being ethereal and, and focused on digital assets, but melds the two, you know? So I might, I might own an, an original painting, right? And like there's an original painter, there's a sister named Sophia Latif, right? Who made this amazing uh, oil-based painting of like the Kaaba with flowers around. And like within two, three minutes of me seeing it, it was bought and sold. I was so mad, right? So now you can buy a print of that, right? So imagine like she creates this amazing oil painting. She sells the, the original to someone. It's hanging on their wall. And then the digital prints from that she shares the profits from the digital print with the person who funded the original painting. And that happens through an NFT. Because she owns creative rights and they own physical rights. I, I, I'm just kind of spitballing here, but, you know. And shout out to her, because I, I, I do own a couple of her prints. They're really nice. Yeah. Yes. Salaam to A what? So I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up for you. The consensus mechanism is not very relevant to the permissibility as long as it's in being implemented the way that it should be. The problem is the claim of using a consensus, a consensus mechanism like staking when in reality it's just a Ponzi kickback. So you can say, oh, this is proof of stake. Okay, well, what do I do when I stake? Well, if I'm in, I'm in ETH, right, or I want to I wanna go from Ethereum to Ethereum 2, what do I have to do, right? I have to, uh, I have to stake my coins, right? And those are being used to help with the verification and the validation of the nodes. And if I have enough, then I can be a validator and bring other people in and so on and so forth. So there's actual computing that's going on through the digital asset that I own. So that code becomes part of the Ethereum virtual machine, right? Um, but when I have... When I stake my SHIB, I'm simply putting it into something 
that's earning bone and leash and I don't know, dog bowl, whatever else, and there's nothing being validated, there's nothing being algorithmically checked, there's nothing being computed, it's simply paying me from other people buying after the fact that I buy it. So, or I, I'm sorry, after the fact that I bought. So, we, you know, it's, the problem is now is not necessarily with the consensus mechanism and the permissibility thereof, because there's about nine of them I've gone through. I, I feel that each of them is permissible. They look at proof of work, proof of stake, proof of history, um, uh, Byzantine consensus, right? They're all different ways of kind of getting to the same way of making sure that these transactions are verified. The problem is, is that people are saying that they're doing this, but they're doing something complete. So it's a marketing issue and a transparency issue, which is why I focused on that. Yeah. So I would say, you know, this, like, like this is the this is the cheat sheet here to look at. You know, regardless of consensus mechanism, if it fits this slide, you're good. And Allah knows best. Yes, the sister back there. Say again. The tax implications of owning a coin, you'd have to talk to a tax attorney. I'm, I'm not abreast of, of the taxes. Um, that's one area that I just hire people to do for me, and I don't really even advise clients on that, um, just because it's, it's so ever-changing. But you should definitely look into it, because I do know that there were changes with some of the wash rules and things like that. Uh, but talk to a tax attorney. And there are a few people online um, uh, that that I've seen, especially on, on Twitter, that have spe CPAs that have specialized in crypto um, that, you know, you can, you can find by searching for. I mean, I think you should have, like, some kind of deflation, inflation hedge in your portfolio. Some people pr prefer to just hold cash. Some people pr prefer precious metals, and a lot of people are moving into crypto. I think that having anywhere from two to, like I think I said this last night, having anywhere from two to five percent, you know, in crypto for the average investor, you know, is, is a good hedge, right? Um, if, you are, if you are really into it and you understand what you're doing and you, you know, your, your other forms of money you've kind of secured and you want to put more in, uh, the only thing I'd say is, never put money into something that you're not willing to, to, to lose. Yes, more. Um, so I guess this question, uh, so like today, for example, I feel like I'm too ready to do it. Like, uh, if you take your dollar and exchange it for a coin, you can go spend it and use it for financial terms. Um, but what I feel like I've seen more these days is cryptocurrencies, like if you're buying cryptocurrency, you can, I don't never spend it. You're buying it basically just to uh, have an appreciation to sell it back for dollars. And then sure. Sure. Both. It's permissible to buy, hold, and trade, as long as it meets these, these, uh, these stipulations. And Allah knows best. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Um, struggling. Do you want to bring it to a close with maybe some more questions? I think so, yes. I'll let you choose questions. Who's that? Which one? Okay, yeah, hold on. First of all, 10% on anything you make off of my answer. Let's go ahead, go ahead. So it is probably said that we want to create a coin like this one, and like with the same factors, what's the coin they can create stronger than Bitcoin? What makes it stronger than, than Bitcoin? I mean, we've seen this uh, time and time again, right? So Litecoin is, is a fork from the Bitcoin code, right? Dogecoin is, is a fork from, from Bitcoin code. Um, Bitcoin Cash, uh, BSV. Uh, what makes it stronger is the acceptance that people give to it, the in endogenous nature of, yeah, that's it. That's it. L'artibar.
Okay, that's an important, that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. That's true, especially altcoins, yeah. Yeah, it's the... Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it all comes down to adoption in the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. The question is now, how are you going to differentiate, right? In supply and demand, how are you going to differentiate? I mean, for example, like everybody thought, like, you know, Ethereum was going to differentiate by faster transaction speeds and, ch and cheaper. There's this video of like Vitalik saying like, like five cents a transaction. Man, gas fees, you know, you have five cents on Mars maybe. I mean, it's like, gas fees have been ridiculous. Hundred, hundred dollars sometimes, even more. Um, and so who differentiated and took market share? Solana. But then, you know, issues cropped up with that. So, you know, it's, it's all going to be about security, transparency, and differentiation. Yeah. Yes. Yield farming. That's another one of those terms that uh, can be can go both can you know can go different ways. What I understand yield farming to be is generally loaning your your coins and getting paid an interest rate for that loan. Uh, and if that's the case, then it's impermissible. Being an LP, if the LP itself is not involved in anything which is impermissible, meaning that you're, 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 you're contributing a currency pair um, for liquidity purposes, and your LP token is issued that's representative of your partnership with other LP token holders, um, then it's permissible. It's just another form of partnership. And the, the dividends that you're paid from that is no different than buying into a joint share, joint stock company and receiving dividends for their business transactions. Because their, their business is the exchange of money. And as long as that's not being done in a, in a ribawi sense, then it's fine. You know, for, transaction fees are, are permissible. Yeah. No, I'm saying they, 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 they're, not, they're not distributing the transaction fees to you. They're, I mean, well, they're splitting it up between all of the holders of the LP tokens. Are you asking if, the, if what they reward you in is the LP token? As long as it's different than the LP token, I don't find a problem with it. Yeah. Yes, brother, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. You saying with the with the stock market? Okay, but with the with 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 cryptocurrencies. I mean, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I think that the growth of value is based upon demand. And so as long as there's demand for that, then it's going to go up in value. And that's where the, that value is being derived from, right? Uh, generally, currencies before cryptocurrencies wouldn't really see a dividend, right? You would hold a currency and you would hold it for the long term. Um, or you would trade it and you wouldn't really see a dividend from it. Um, but the, the whole staking thing because of the algorithmic nature of cryptocurrencies has added the dividend to it um, that allows you to make you know, additional money. Um, but but there's, there's no harm uh, Islamically in simply buying a currency or an asset and then selling it back for more later on. Um, again, what determines whether or not that currency is, 
is differentiating by bringing value to the world would depend upon the market. And so it's very market and demand uh, focused. Um, and the market will decide whether or not you know, it wants to continue using that or not. And that's why we've seen you know, cryptocurrencies go up and down. Some people might say, well, it's, it, this has all happened in a very short amount of time. And I think that that's, uh, that that's very indicative of just the very fast paced, the digital world that we live in. Um, and, and not necessarily a fault, but it's, it's, it's not a, um, it's a feature, not a fault, right? Um, but, but in what value, the, va the value of that crypto is going to be determined by the market. Sure. Right. So, so, so that's, that's why, for that reason, that's why we are mandated to pay Zakat on currencies. So 2.5% of your currency is because it's sitting as currency. So if you're holding crypto, guys, you still have to pay Zakat on it. Right? Um, and and I, I, I'm actually adding a new chapter to my book, Simple Zakat Guide just on how to calculate it on cryptocurrencies. But, uh, and I believe I have an article on my website about it already. Um, but the reason for paying Zakat on currency of any type, crypto, representative, physical, fiat, is because you're holding value, but that value is not being mobilized. So if your value is not mobilized, then that value needs to uh, taper off to help in charitable and charitable acts through Zakat. Thank you for actually asking that. That kind of like got the wheels running for me. Alhamdulillah. That was a good question. All right, everyone. I hope that uh, everyone ben benefited. Um, I just want to say, last point, sisters, you can accept your mahar in cryptocurrency. I've actually gone to two weddings where it's happened. One in Bitcoin and one in, uh, in ETH. The guy who did Bitcoin is kind of regretful. Because, you know, price spiked up right after that. His wife is not regretful. Um, but, you know, Jazakumullah khairan for uh, tolerating um, my presentation. If I've said anything correct, and then it's from Allah alone. If I've said anything incorrect, then it's from myself and from Shaitan. I ask you to overlook any faults or any mistakes. Uh, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, put barakah in your time. And uh, bless you with an easy path to Jannah as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman sahala Allahu lahu tariqan ilal Jannah whoever sets out on a path seeking knowledge Allah will make their path to Jannah easy may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make each and every one of your paths to Jannah easy bless you in your wealth your health your family and everything you do and Jazakumullah khayyan especially to Umar for the invitation our beloved Imam and Shaykh here locally I really appreciate him, alhamdulillah. He has unprecedentedly hosted me uh, in a way that has not happened in a very long time. I'm very, very appreciative for that. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, visiting your community. Uh, I really like this masjid too. It's just, you know, architecturally and the ambiance and most importantly, the believers that are here uh, praying in it. So, barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless each and every one of you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi
alhamdulillah, that's only because of the volunteers, the board member, and some of the employees and the staff that really push forward all of this barakah. And a third thing that I want to announce that encourages, inshallah, your donations and your membership and even your participation, we have a new program called the Mantle of Mercy. And what it is is prison outreach. The forgotten brothers and sisters of our ummah, those who are in prison, who are requesting that they have a connection with the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have some of our participants. Lastly, we need Ramadan volunteers. And I know some of them are my pleasure. Jazakallah You made very important contributions to the conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Islam? Joe, mashaAllah. Islam ish? Atasi. Atasi, mashaAllah. Very nice to meet you. Are you 